So on this episode, we're doing an exercise to confront what is probably the biggest problem a film director has, which is what do you do when the scene isn't working? How do you deal with the feeling of dead air behind the scene? And what do you do when you don't know what to even to tell the actors? This is scary stuff, and this is the norm. And you should actually be surprised when a scene just works out of the box. So the difference between a scene that's limping along and one that works is that we've figured out what's going on inside of it. We figured out what people want and how they're standing in each other's way. Basically, we figured out the conflict and we figured out the subtext. So ideally, you'd be able to stand on the set with a scene that isn't working and immediately say something brilliant that turns the ship around. But trust me, nobody can do this. Even big directors have the same knot in their stomachs as you do when it just isn't working. So this exercise is that we look at someone else's work that isn't quite there, and then we do the work of figuring out the scene. And this is a tough exercise, but every time we become a little bit better at it. And maybe one day we might actually even be good at it. So no pain, no gain. Let's do the show. The two people who are practicing with me today are first Brendan Hughes, a Yale-educated director who's a writer, director, animator, and editor in advertising, and he's a professor of theater at Santa Monica College and Occidental College. And next is Brandon Galatz, a talented actor I've had the pleasure of working with. He's done a lot of indie movies, guest starred on a number of TV shows, and done a lot of theater in Chicago. Check all the links below. Prep Show is brought to you by Hollywood Camera Work. Check out Causality Story Sequencer, which is a new kind of writing app where you develop your story visually. Prep Show airs on YouTube and Indie Film Hustle TV and as a podcast. And remember to subscribe to get notified of new episodes. Hi, uh, Brandon and Brendan. This is going to be hell. Just right up front <laughs> so uh brandon we worked together like a while back on the directing actors uh, course and then since then you became a union actor and i've i've seen you in like a bunch of things now do you want to like just quickly itemize i mean we're just keeping as busy as possible i was living in la i'm, I'm from chicago originally and, and started you know when i was a wee pup and uh you know whether whether it's commercial or theater or film or musical or everything that that we can get our hands on you know the point of the work for me is that, you know, I'm kind of at, I'm, I'm at that point now in my own, my own standpoint is that, you know, I need to do work that matters to me. So personally, you know, the, the quote unquote, do you want fries with that? I pass on those. Um, the pay is <laughs> I get it, but it's like, you know, I need to live vicariously through these characters and through the writers and through the director's eyes. Um, so that's, that's what, what drives me and what gets me. So, um, Awesome. Well, I mean, we'll also get to do some of that here because so basically the, the primary, but not the entire reason, but part of the reason that, that you're here is to just be the actor so that as we're sitting here figuring out what to tell with the actors, what to tell the actors, you can like uh, just raise a hand and say, um, uh, I'm an actor and that wouldn't work for me. And, oh. and then we can try to improve the directing. I want to say hi to Brendan as well, because we've we've known each other for a long time on Facebook, but this is the first time we meet in like quote unquote person and you had a podcast or have a yeah, podcast. Yes. Yeah, I do. My, uh, my friend and I, uh, Jeff, uh, started a podcast when we both became fathers about seven years ago, um, because we saw each other a lot at rock shows and, uh, um, we went to the movies, we'd go to dive bars and then all of that evaporated the moment we became parents. And so we started this podcast as sort of a, uh, a way to maintain our sanity and we would get together and complain about parenthood as sort of, so it's sort of in, in a way like an anti-mommy blog, you know? <laughs> okay. And so it's a comedy podcast about uh the dark side of being a dad called oh called dad jeans that's important okay there's going to be a link below so why don't we just get into it here so basically the exercise that we're doing here is this is an exercise that i've done a lot and it's hard because for a director because it confronts all your weaknesses um because basically we pick a short film that somebody made on the internet uh, not for the purpose of sitting and slamming it but for the purpose of figuring out what's wrong with it. And if we got, if we had a chance to step in there and direct it again, um, what would we say to the actors? 
And not just that, how would we think about the scene? Because half of it is not even the acting. Half of it is like the blocking and the timing and just the logic of what people are doing. Like you need to figure out what's going on in a scene. And so the the one that I found here is a, is a scene from a short that I've practiced from a bit. I just did a thing uh, the other day where we did one of the other scenes in here. And these are hard to find because you can't just, you can't just find a short film that has bad acting where mm -hmm. just everybody who's involved is just not there yet because you can't really address that. The way to address that is to become better at it and then try again. Um, these are things that could have, you can see that there are resources in the actors and there are re there's resources in everybody, but they're not nailing it. And it, this could be a lot better with better direction. And, and if the scene was thought about in a better way. So, um, in just a moment, let's. We should watch the scene, and then obviously the conversation is going to sound a little bit critical in the beginning. But it's just remember that we're not here to take the scene down. We're here to take responsibility for the scene, and um, that should hopefully be a little more a little more constructive. Did you you guys obviously had? Did you have a, a chance to look at the scene and and have some thoughts about it? Yeah. Okay, so why don't we do this? The The link is going to be in the description. And uh, do you guys have the video queued up or do you have the ability? Yep. Uh, okay. Yeah, I have it here. Okay, so we're parked at 142. All right, Travis, make it quick. What do you do this time? Look, I know every detective has his own way of working. I get that. But Reynolds, he doesn't just bend proper protocol, sir. <laughs> For lack of a better term, he takes a complete dump on it. <laughs> it's not funny. All right, well, I'm not transferring you, okay? Well, Captain, you I need you both on the case. There's just no discussion. Right? Mayor is so far up my butt with this whole missing college girl thing, I can feel his mustache tickle my kidneys. I need everybody out there I can get to track this girl down. Hey, if nothing else, it gives you a chance to give Reynolds a message, all right? Don't say, with all due respect, sir. Uh, Look, yes. if you both can bring in this missing girl without any of his hijinks or anything like that, maybe he'll see the light. I don't know. Maybe he'll see you can get the result without the misconduct. How am I Or you know what? You can turn your back on him like you tried to do today. I don't know. If I suspend them, what happens to the case? Huh, it's your conscience, your call. If I were you, I'd start thinking about that missing college girl. Okay, let's stop here. Let me provide a little bit of context that I probably should have provided before. So uh, this, the young cop and his buddy, they've been, they've been chasing some kind of drug dealer. And... Um, and they want to do something about that, but there's a missing girl and they can't, the, the chief here, the police chief, uh, won't let them pursue that lead unless it also basically leads to figuring out something about this college girl. And later it turns out that these stories are actually connected. It's the, that guy is involved with the missing college girl. Um, but that's, that's a lot to take in. But so <laughs> if anybody's confused, please rewind and watch it again. And then let's carry on. Brandon, you look like uh, you have a couple of, uh, a couple of thoughts. Yeah. So, oh. you know, in, oh, in, in, see, we already did it. Uh, <laughs> I was like, I, Oh wait, wait, Oh, Brandon, Brandon in <laughs> Chicago. Brandon, Brandon. Go ahead. Um, so I, I think the, the first thing, the first thing, and again, you know, the most important thing for me um, to look at the project uh, in, in the context so that it's 168, our festival that this was done in, which means it's essentially one week that they wrote it, shot it, directed it, edited it, got it up on its feet and go. So, um, tricky, super tricky. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, we've all done our festival circuit and things like that. So first thing I always like to do before I delve in is just kind of give credit where credit is due and knowing, yeah. you know, the work that was done and, um, you know, sometimes you have a slam dunk, sometimes you don't, but, uh, um, there's, I think, I think there's a nice idea. Um, I think there's some bones to, to the work itself, to the, to the, the, um, the scene itself and to the project as a whole. Um, it just some logistical things, uh, that for me, you know, that, that missed the, missed the key a little bit. Um, biggest thing for me is I like the archetypes of the characters. I think that's clear. Um, you know, you, you've got, you know, your lead, your lead lieutenant coming out and the eating and the funny and the ha ha ha. Let's just get to the point. Just do what you got to do and move on. And then you've got your young buck cop who's looking at this. And again, I'm trying to look at this from like the actor perspective. Um, but your young buck cop who's looking at, at, at this as a career and wants to play by the, you know, wants to play by the books and wants to play by the rules in order to further himself for whatever reasons. Mm -hmm. um, 
So the bones of it are there. Um, I think that the the shots were it's a pretty it's a pretty picture. Um, you know, as far as the framing and the lighting and things like that. Um, but for me, you know, we're we're rushing it uh, as if almost it was like a procedural. But with the procedural, you're still, you know, you're taking and receiving, right? And so I think there's a lot of throwing the ball here, but no one's catching it. Exactly. Yeah, that's one of my major notes. So I'm glad you picked that up too. Should we jump yeah. jump over to Brendan in L.A.? Brendan, <laughs> go ahead. Yes. I, one one thing that jumps out. It, yeah, this 168 hours to make a short film is a is a major accomplishment. So thank you for pointing that out, Brandon, yeah. because that is really something else to sit down and start writing something, and then seven days later it's edited and color corrected. Uh, I, I would say that the the over the top the first thing that jumps out at me as a uh, as something that I would like to leap on for a second take let's say of this um of this scene is the fact that it doesn't seem to cost tavish very much much emotionally and i and so that got me thinking like there's somewhere in this scene there's got to be something that changes his world irreparably and for me it hinges on the line where the captain says uh you can turn your back on him like you tried to do today so suddenly it's a world for Tavish where, oh, crap, suddenly I, I came into this police force probably believing in justice like a lot of young cops do. Mm. But what I'm learning, especially by that line right there, is, oh, in this precinct at least, loyalty is more important than justice. And that is not what I expected here. So suddenly, blam, it's a world where I have to compromise my own fundamental mm. beliefs and what brought me into this career in order to succeed here, which is a major uh, dash of cold water to the face. Mm. And then also, it's suddenly a world where the, his captain uh, thinks he's two-faced. And that has got to hit him as well. In, the, in this particular scene, yeah. in the take they chose, he kind of looks to the sunset and shakes his head in that moment, which he does in other moments as well. But for me, that yeah. would hit him like a ton of bricks. That that's, that's interesting moment. because one of my notes just really was that there are no beats in the scene. And, mm -hmm. but I was, I was kind of coming at it from the angle that there are no beats period, but the beats are actually in there. The beats are written in and they're given zero attention. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And yeah. so how would those, how would you have made those beats work? Like, I think, even just stopping and processing what's happening would have turned it into a beat. Right. Yes. And getting that moment. And if I were editing it, I would look for his reaction or find a reaction where he really is stopped short by something like that. Yeah. And there is an opportunity for other beats, I think, where the cap the captain is playing cat and mouse or could as as written. The captain keeps making him think he's making progress and then dashing his hopes at the last minute. There's another line where he says uh, something uh, you, you don't expect it to go uh, the end of this line to go uh, how it goes where he says maybe uh, if you do this right and then pause he'll see the light but you think he's going to say something like I'll transfer you to another partner you know and so they, there's an opportunity for the actor playing the captain to really toy with his emotions and that's where you could start to define mm -hmm. these beats. so there's a whole there's a whole evolution for the for the the chief they're almost like he's like leading him on and then no right yeah 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 i mean I, the the biggest one of the biggest things for me was essentially it's funny brendan um <laughs> Well, you're not confused when you're talking to him. It's okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna be we're gonna be emphasizing the vowels today. Yeah, yeah. lesson in vowels. Go ahead. Oh, right. More emotion <laughs> in the vowels that way. Um, but the it's funny that you said you know on a second take because that's what I feel. Um, you know where we can we can really get in there because essentially I feel like okay, let's find you know that this this shot was all right. Let's go through the moments and let's let's just let's just run it. Let's see what you guys brought to it. And then let's, let's work on that. And that's, that's where I feel that, you know, the, the, the cap, the captain or, or Lieutenant or whatever, but um, you know, he's got his, yeah, the actor. And that's the biggest thing I'm seeing. I'm seeing the actors. I'm not seeing the work or, you know, I'm not seeing yeah. the characters flesh out. But and I want to, I want to point out a couple of things about that because I mean, we've been saying here that it's 168 hour film project and, and it is impressive to churn that out in that period of time. But that's also an episode of TV that works the exact same way. It's, Absolutely. it's, 
it's like you're just being shooting a movie while being chased by a SWAT team, basically. Yeah. And yeah. and so the thing is that you need to create a protective bubble around the acting because, th- I mean, I know, I mean, th- there's a big directing lesson in here because the fact that the production is super stressed is not a good enough explanation, I think. Like, you need to know that's going to happen because that happens almost all the time. And if you're not aware of that, it's going to spill right into the acting. And it's going to it's going to spill in a, in a variety of ways. It's like, no, 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 let's just shoot faster. Okay, go, go, go. And and then the actor's like, okay, uh, uh, let me try to be nuanced in a hurry. Um, <laughs> I mean, that's half of it. The other half of it is that when you're stressed as a director, you lose your ability to judge the take. Mm-hmm. And... <clears throat> basically if you when you desensitize it's just going to take more and more and more to impress you and that means that <clears throat> you start wanting more and more and more emotion and you start celebrating more and more and more emotion and then everything looks like a soap opera afterwards yeah that's so well said and i i, I remember watching a scene uh f- from the outtakes of bad lieutenant protocol new orleans by, uh, directed by Werner Herzog. Have you guys seen that movie? I have not, but it's almost sounds. It's already sounds fun the way you're describing it. <laughs> it's it's crazy. I mean, he said it's Werner Herzog. You know, so at the so at some Q and A, a friend my a friend of mine went to. He said at some point something like, "We did not realize it was a comedy until we were halfway through editing." Like he's that's the kind of like <laughs> Gonzo approach he was taking. But in the, but I watched the behind the scenes, and there's a shot of him um, on set, and at one he's having a conversation, and at one point he says. Be quiet to the entire set. It is too loud on my set. And he really polices the the mm. urgency and the feel the buzz because he doesn't want any buzz to on spill, the set. To spill into the scene. Exactly. And it but yeah. that happens all the time. And so that's the that's something that could have been legitimately done here, whether you have 168 hours or or whatever you have. I mean, Brandon, you've been on sets that have worked in both ways. Like do you feel a difference between a, a stressed set and a calm set? This Brendan or that Brandon? Well, Brandon. Sorry. Yeah. Brandon. Oh, yeah. In Chicago. Oh, maybe blue, blue shirt, gray shirt. Yeah. 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 I'll say West Coast, West Coast, Midwest, right? Yeah. Oh, there um, you go. So I think, yeah. And I think, I think, um, you know, Brandon, I think, you know, we, we, we've all done this and pair. I mean, we've, we've all been in these situations where, you know, you, you show up and whether it's a TV set, like you said, and that's why I brought in like a procedural idea, because essentially it's like, you'll, you'll get hired, you'll get the job. Tuesdays, you read through Wednesdays, you're blocking and then you're shooting and you're going. And it's not a lot of, you know, necessarily you're sitting at a desk and going like this, but there's action and there's movement. So I think I've been in the situations where it's magic and you show up and everyone's ready to go. And all the pieces majestically fall into place and all of a sudden it's done and you say, huh, that was great. That was phenomenal. Okay. And then reality comes in and then you find a lot of the sets that you fall, that, that you work on where it, a lot of the pieces aren't in place. Maybe it's for preparation. Maybe it's because we're rushing. Maybe it's because people aren't, aren't necessarily knowing what they're supposed to do, what they want to do or making clear choices. Um, that's from the acting side. From the directing side, um, you know, there is there's there's a certain amount of trust that I always put in to the outside eyes because I tell my directors, um, so I'm going to make some big, bold, wild choices. Mm-hmm. Please, please pull me back. Just just I'm, I'm begging you to pull me back. And I've done projects where we've we've shot a feature in six and a half days. You know, we were doing 20 hour nights. This was pre-union, but some, you know, 20 some hour nights in it. And it was, and it was crazy. And, um, you know, at, at some points uh, they worked and at some points we were delirious and in, in saying, well, let's just get to the next shot. And we'll fix it in post. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. that, well, is some, that brings up something for me that uh, Brandon, that you're talking about where I love working with actors like you that are bringing in a lot of really interesting wild choices and it's always this tango where if i have to say okay i'm gonna want less then i have to come up with constraints for for you emotional constraints that but it's great because it pushes the directing to the next level so if tavish in this scene were going and making huge choices which would be a great thing to to work with but you find but as a director you find i need to 
pull this down a little bit. It's hard to go up to an actor and say, less. Can I have less of that? You know what I mean? So you have to come up with something, some know. emotionally can, motivated Can I thing. jump in and, so, and have, a, have a little opinion oh, yeah. about that? Because that's cool, Brandon, that you do that. That your default position is that I'm uh, I'm going to do something insane, and then you have to contain it somehow because that's not most actors. And it's actually so I don't. There's a quote that I don't know where it's from, but it's that you can always turn the volume down, but you can't turn up something that isn't there. And <laughs> and basically, here I mean most actors they go straight for subtlety and really feeling and really being in the moment, and it's very subtle and. What's behind that subtleness is often like just nothing at all. And that's why I think, for example, for rehearsals, it's great to just chew the scenery and just be overact the shit out of it because then we can find out what we're working with. Then we know that it's definitely that choice and not that choice over on the other side. But if you're just subtle then you might be hiding the fact that the character is nobody in particular. The character is just the actor breathing. Yeah. So for me, it's, it's, you know, I use the analogy and, and this is again, coming from some of my mentors, Ted Hurl and Eileen Vorbeck and some of my Meisner mentors and Julian Grant is another director I work with out here. Um, and what, what they often tell have, have told us and that we, you know, something that I, you know, when I teach other actors is you want to, um, you know, get that steam engine to the top, mm -hmm. right? It's your preparation. That's, you know, what you're bringing into that moment, because pair, like you said, it's not about what you're showing. It's not. It's about what you're holding back. Yeah, and especially, especially, you know, you know, you've got your five, you're mad, glad, happy, scared, you know, excited, whatever. But it's about what you're holding back. I want to I want to piggyback off of the thing of about holding it back, because that's a that's a cool way to articulate it, that it's. That it's, I mean, that's, a, I guess it, it's really a way of saying it's not the text, it's the, it's the subtext, and the subtext is the stuff that you're not showing. Like, if we were to frame this scene in terms of what they're not showing, like, what are they holding back? It's, it seems like this scene here would benefit a lot from some work with each of the actors about what they're holding back. Yeah. yeah should, I should, would we, love should we try to spitball a little bit of a few ideas about what they could be holding back? Sure. Uh, Brian, if you want to go. Yeah, I, I think the, the what the captain guy is trying to say or is trying to get the young uh, get Tavish to understand is that to be a cop here, uh, you have to behave differently. You can't come and tattle on your partner all the time. That is not going to work for you. But he's not spelling it out. Instead, he's being sort of dismissive and being almost aggressively casual and being like, yeah, you'll be fine. I'm not going to transfer you. We got to solve this thing. The mayor's up my butt. Okay. You know what I mean? So you so he had what he is holding back is the key to uh, Tavish becoming a good police officer in his eyes. Can you articulate and what he's holding back? Yeah, um, loyalty. Your loyalty is much more important than, than rules than the book. and justice. So, yeah. how about if what he it, how what if he's much more upset about that than he lets on? Like, mm. for example, what if we worked with, you know, like if if he was just much more like stunned at the disloyalty and 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 you know much more angry on behalf of all police officers and what if he had memories of being betrayed like that him mm -hmm. like like that himself like so he had like a real charge about that thing because then there's something to hold back yeah and reynolds could be a, a key to that too what is the relationship between this guy the superior and reynolds is it that reynolds has some dirt on him and he has to protect him is it that Reynolds screwed up and he's punishing him with this newbie partner. Is it that they're best friends? There's something about what or is it that he just loves the way Reynolds is a cop? He thinks he's an artiste and he's creative and he plays with the rules and he loves that about him. Don't There's you something just think about that that this attack on Reynolds by basically ratting out Reynolds? Don't you think the chief just feels that that's essentially also an attack on him? Mm, yes, right. And you can get it personalized that way. Yeah and, yeah, and and what if we created a backstory of the chief literally getting ratted out? Like he did the right thing, but not by the book, and he got ratted out, and he got punished for doing mm -hmm. the good thing, and like really paid a heavy price for it. Like if we, 
if we spend some time creating that history, wouldn't, I mean, Brandon in Chicago, you, you answer me. If we did some, some work on that backstory, would you feel differently walking into that scene? A hundred percent, a hundred percent. You know, there's pair, I think when we work together, um, you know, what I, what I liked is that you had so many different, different uh, avenues and different angles that we could go through. But for me, the, you know, one of the questions that comes up is why now? Why, why now, you know? Okay, good. Good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Well, yeah. What is it about this time? About this time, this now, you know, has, has he warned him before? Again, is, does he have a history? You know, why is this now the, this is the important time? Because I think that that's going to bring, that's something that's missing rather than, you know, okay, let's just get it done. Let's just move forward. But if this is the last damn time, and I told you before that I don't want to hear any more about this, that I know what's going on in the department, and there's your beat. Mm -hmm. Let's find what we have to find. Because then he, he can find his comedic elements with, are we understood? But. Yeah. Good. Here, yeah. you can finish the pizza. It's been a long night. Or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> you know? But um, because because I think I think the why now um, is something that and absolutely you know figuring out and coming up with that arrangement and that history that they have had um, and with you know with with uh, uh, with his partner as well you know and that he's I mean he's he's the Hank Voigt the the Chicago PD reference you know he's mm -hmm. he's the guy that gets it done no matter what and he you know makes up his own rules because those are the rules of the road. Those are the rules of the street. Um, yeah, but he's realistic. That's it. And perhaps he's even seen cops die uh, as a result of this kind of the, a turncoat partner. Oh, good. Partner so that's through. again charge. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so he's really upset. I mean, inside, he's really upset about about people who think the way the young cop thinks. Right. And because he has to they, break they are legally right, but morally wrong. Right. right. Yeah. Yeah. And the, on and the, Tavish's side, yeah, oh, oh, I was oh. say, on uh, Tavish's side, in terms of hold, what to be holding back, there might be something really driving him as well. A promise to, again, with the death, but a promise to a dead relative. Uh, 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 maybe um, he hated cops growing up, and so it is really important to him to be a cop that isn't corrupt or crooked. We could mm -hmm. load up the way we load up the, loaded up uh, his superior just now. We load up something about him that is really driving him into the scene with mm -hmm. a ticket that he must get punched. Who was his dad? Who was his yeah. dad? His dad was that, you know, that could be something that could fire it up. You know, he's grew up, he grew up in the family and his dad was the cop and his dad, you know, either played by the rules or played by the rules, but then something happened. The dad got, you know, got killed for, for stepping out of line or something. But there, there is, you're, you're absolutely right. That there is something that we can, Again, fill that fill that steam engine with, um, mm. because again, you know, there's the why not, and then like like I had said, the fear. What are you afraid of losing? If if you know if you lose this job, what does that mean? If you know, right. if you're stuck in the in a bad position that you don't want to be in, what are you afraid of? And yeah. and the um, you know the lieutenant as well. Like there's got to be some kind of ultimatum fear within him as well that you know what is he what is he not telling us what does he know really mm -hmm. um that that could add some you know i mean almost like a suspenseful edge to it per se mm -hmm. you know i mean this kind of this this borders on something else because clearly now the characters are coming from more specific places and I think even just that would read differently. If, if we had done this already, the actors wouldn't play the scene the way they were doing now. Um, but still about beats. Um, in, I mean, in, I've been struggling a little bit with this scene here. In which way could they be different? I mean, could one of them be in a different place at the end than they are at the beginning? Because I, I'm not feeling any evolution here, really. Mm-hmm. And it would be right. nice to, I mean, it, it's kind of, if there's no evolution in a scene, then it's not really contributing to the, to the math problem of the, of the story. Like it's not adding or subtracting anything. And then why are we, 
Why are we doing two, two plus two minus two? It's like, why did, right. why did we have to do that? <laughs> yeah. yeah the, I, I think Tavish, Tav, we should watch Tavish's, Tavish's, um, uh, the image of Tavish in the Lieutenant's mind needs to go like this over the course of the scene. And Tavish has to watch it happen. He's trying to curate the, his boss's image of him as a cop and it's getting worse and worse and worse over the course of it. And I think it could actually be helped in a way by the blocking, which currently is, you know, walk and talks are always very exciting, but there are problems with the way that it was uh, shot from a, per, from a director's perspective and where they stop and why. Uh, wh uh, and where I think where blocking, do they stop? Do you remember where they stop on what line? He stops on that's not, he laughs and then says, that's not funny. But right after that is the big reveal where he says, look, I'm not going to transfer you. And I, and he, so he stops too early because he gets to the mark too quickly. Is that really, uh, that's almost in the beginning. And then they're standing still for the rest of the scene. Somehow exactly. I, I felt right. like this, like a walking scene, but they're almost not walking. No, they, they begin, they're walking way too fast. As a director, I would say, oh my God, slow way down. And they have these two extras who are cops that they walk past. And that's an opportunity. They could use those. The, the lieutenant could use them to demonstrate for Tavish some way that they interact where he's like, see, this is how you'd be a good cop in my presence with mm -hmm. the extras or something. Something mm -hmm. very very quick, half a second. And Tavish could also have to hide from them his the way that he's ratting out his partner right now. They, But they just walk by as sort of window dressing and there's a lost opportunity there. And then I can't bring myself to not, not say this, at 153 you see the crew in the background. Did you guys notice that? No, I'm going to go there now. <laughs> 153. Yeah, it's a it's only like four or five frames, but you see a couple of, uh, a couple of guys standing with a, with a diffusion flag. <laughs> I'm, I can't see it. And if you play it on slow motion, you'll see there's a guy with sunglasses and a guy holding a boom pole in front of a. Oh yeah. I'm not seeing it. Where? Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's totally a that's that's totally a diffusion flag. Okay. Uh, <laughs> well, only people only people who make movies know what that is. So for the right, general yeah, yeah, consumer, that could just be the back of a sign or something. Right. But okay. Yeah. And I don't want to throw stones. I've made plenty of. Uh, I mean, can I point out that every movie has these in them, though? Even when the movie cost a hundred million dollars, it's still full of reflections oh, yeah. of boom guys and stuff like oh, that. Oh, come the on, the Game, Matrix, Game, Game of Thrones, like Starbucks, Starbucks was a big sponsor on that one. Oh, that's. <laughs> 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 I know who among us. I know it's true. But so the blocking where they walking, they could they could stop so many more times to indicate the moments where the captain is going to turn, talk to him. Ha they take a couple steps. He says, "Look, I'm not going to transfer you." Turns, keeps walking. They do that one big cross and stop. But that this could be much better served demarked by uh, mm. by these stops. Are and the second thing is they shoot okay. from the they shoot them from behind at one point. And that I feel like walk and talks where you where you shoot the front of them talking are great in the beginning of a story. And if they're if you're shooting them from behind, you have to know what their destination is, because the destination is also a character. If you don't know where they're going, then shooting them from behind just becomes a wouldn't it be cool if uh, extra angle. So I uh, would more decision. I would more kind of give I, I would excuse that choice because this is clearly just running out of time and not being able to get the setups that they want. And I think they're being realistic. Well, yeah. I, I, I also think that, you know, with and, and it's funny that that you bring that up because, um, you know, the question in my head comes, why stop? Why stop? You know, the the young, you know, the young cop is you know, he's, he's got his ear, he's got his chirp in his ear, um, but there's not a reason that the older cop stops. If the young cop, and again, this could be a choice, but the, the young cop, you know, does something to stop. Let me tell you what I feel, because then all of a sudden there's there's a spike, right? And then they'll go somewhere instead of just... Yeah, that's that, true. That. It is weird why they stop, but let me, let me uh, say the larger weirdness that this comes out of, which mm -hmm. is... What's the captain's motivation here? Why is he saying all of this? Mm -hmm. I don't understand. I mean, I, so the young cop, I kind of understand his where he's coming from. It's mm -hmm. not super interesting, maybe. I mean, we could work on the beats, but he's coming from somewhere. I feel like the captain, I have no idea where. I, I don't know why he's giving him all this information. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, he's very colorfully written too. I mean, he's a he's the soul of a poet. Where he's saying like, "Is so far up my butt as mustache is tickling my kidneys." Well, There's so many nouns, delicious, vivid nouns that he's firing. But this particular why not spend the, just a little bit more time on them? But I, I mean, yeah. okay, can I just count? I, I want to comment on on the way that he's doing this, and I want to send you a um, I want to send you a clip from Seinfeld. And so, can okay. you guys can you guys receive this in the chat? Coy? I'm not being coy. Is he being coy? <laughs> yeah, coy. You're being coy. Now, where's Kramer, Newman? You want to know what happened to Kramer? I'll tell you what happened to Kramer. He was ticked off about the keys. Yeah, that's right, about the keys. <laughs> Thought he got a bad rap. Bad rap? Yeah, from you. Me? You heard me. So he packed a grip and he split for the coast. La La Land, L.A. So... They're making fun of these like uh, film noirs w that just go way too fast, and it's <laughs> and it's funny. He was ticked off about the right. keys. Yes, about the yeah, keys. And these words, the words are sort of they're like klaxons from a submarine, yeah. like ping, ping, ping. You but know? it's just, I mean, because the text is written exactly like this one is written. That they're just these mm -hmm. mwah, mwah, cool, good lines in there, and and I thought. I mean, I didn't for a long time realize what this was a parody of, but now I've seen those those black and white movies where they just talk way too fast, and it's almost like the the actors are just trying to get through the script, and there are all kinds of pauses that are expected that would let the lines work, right? But you're just you're just hammering over them. It's like you're not. I mean, it would be like doing a comedy but not holding for laughs or stuff like right. that. And, and that and that is that's the biggest thing that I saw too because there's a couple tells in that. You know, where they're literally pushing through the words, you know, there's the laugh that the cop has that it's a laugh, but it's not in response to anything. There's, you know, the, the young, the young cop has, and it's, I know it because it's like, we've all done it, but it's a talk, 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 <sighs> talk, talk, talk. But it, it, <laughs> you, know, you know the sound, it's the ha, huh. you know, where it's like, it's just, it's just like a, a physical thing where you're thinking of the next word, you're thinking of the next word. <sighs> And, and there's it, not it, enough it, air. You need to breathe yeah. also once in a while. Right. Yeah. Right. Not on his breath. And, and that's like so, that gutter, so, I that mean, gutter. see, here's, I feel like here's what ought to have happened is that there, there ought to be some reactions. Like, mm -hmm. I mean, if we looked at the, some of the things, because the captain has the better lines here. And mm -hmm. for example, I mean, actually you said that the laugh isn't motivated. I thought that was kind of motivated because the Tavish says, for lack of a better term, he takes a complete dump on it. And then the mm -hmm. captain laughs and then says, that's not funny. Um, which is actually kind of clever written, I think. Um, Agreed. Where, so he says, the mayor is so far up my butt with this whole missing college girl thing, I can feel his mustache tackle my, tickle my kidneys. <laughs> and then a reaction. And then the reaction. What should, like, I mean, what, where, how should, what should Tavish think about that? Like he could think, ooh, gross. I mean, basically, any kind of reaction would indicate that he's listening. Mm -hmm. But right, and yeah. I mean, but you wouldn't, you would never hear that and just not react. I mean, you you would laugh, and then, for example, if if Tavish is being really serious, then he'd like laugh and then quickly stop himself from laughing. That would also be a reaction. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. He's and entered the octagon with a wordsmith, and he probably is realizing at that moment, I need to step up my game. And then he has, a, a, in order to be able to communicate with this guy, who's such a raconteur, you know. But then he has several lines where he uh, is cut off by the captain, one after another. He has those lines that are written with the dash dash or the ellipses mm -hmm. at the end, which are always so hard to deliver. And I have I find myself wondering if the if the actor who played Tavish had time to figure out what the rest of those lines were. So well, that the, the, this was this was actually a good question. Brandon, how do you how how do you do your best job doing interruptions? Do you need to write the rest of the line? I always do. Yeah. I, um, I, I always do. And again, this is one of the things where, you know, I, when I come into it, the first thing, the first thing that I say, you know, whether it's the first table read or if you're coming in as a day player is I go to my director and if I can't go to the director, I go to the AD and I go to the other players and I just want to say, I, so I just want to let you guys know, I completely trust you wherever you're going to go. I'm going to follow you and I completely trust you. And so when they, when I have these ellipses, um, I let them know, I'm like, I'm going to keep going. Cut me off. Bingo. Just yeah. Like for real. 
for real. Like I'm no. going to keep going. So mm-hmm. cut me off. And you know, there'll always be a couple of times where they won't and I'll just keep going. And sometimes <laughs> that's good. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes we use the take and sometimes the writers will be like, that was great. We, that was, so we're going to take credit for that. And I'm like, be my guest. You just got to tell me what the heck I said. <laughs> yeah. But, and that always injects those moments of humanity. Also like in the theater, you, whenever an actor goes up on their lines and forgets where they are, that's when the audience leans forward because suddenly real life has entered the room in a way that it usually doesn't. And so in those moments on set, when you uh, keep going and then the actor gets flustered and they're supposed to stop you because a character is supposed to stop you yeah. and can't, and uh, forgets you know what? to do it or how. I, I want to inject something. There's, there was something that I did in the directing actors course because the, I was interested in how to make better listening. I'm not sure that I've completely figured out how to make better listening, but the script is a huge problem in listening. That is, as soon as we know, I mean, I don't even have to remember your lines, just the fact that if I know that your lines are coming from a script, then I'm definitely just waiting for you to finish talking so I can say mine. And <laughs> And so I did an exercise where we tried in secret to swap out some words. Like we swap out, um, I mean, it's like you just take, I need you on the case and and just uh, swap it out with, do you like cucumbers or do you want to go home and play Legos or something like that? And immediately when you do that, the other person is off guard. Um, and you can just see that actual listening starts happening. Right. And then you change, and then when you go back to the script, they don't feel completely sure what's going to be said. And it's pretty cool how the script now has listening because they're just enough off kilter. They don't mm-hmm. know with a hundred percent certainty what's coming. And yeah. just that little, just that, just a door, just a crack open with uncertainty creates a ton of listening here. And it- and so that's why this was just a dovetail off you finishing the line and basically making some stuff up. I mean, when when I write, I put a lot of work a lot of work into just getting the perfect wording, and I'm pretty annoyed when the when when the if the actors change the text too much, at least when they start losing the meaning. But mm-hmm. the it's actually a good thing that the actors are ten percent off the script because it keeps every everybody's paying much more attention. When you're when you're basically paraphrasing a little bit, sure. It's like uh, putting a putting a batter off balance at the plate. You know, you want mm-hmm. them as a pitcher to be a little bit off balance, and then they don't know what pitch is coming next, and it injects that yeah that verisimilitude. And that means I've that they, a little bit of they have to pay ten times more attention suddenly. Yeah, right. Yeah. They suddenly key in. I've I, when I when I've been directing actors, and I can tell that there's a listening issue. I've, I've sometimes had success asking them to picture with their actively picture what is being the nouns coming out of the character their their mm-hmm. scene partner's mouth so, and so that it's not an inner monologue it's an inner slideshow you know where yeah. if you are making pictures out of the other spoken words then it gives you something active to do besides just sort of passively receiving mm-hmm. um the but this is a major thing i mean this is this is a major part of screen presence is that you're simply visualizing the things that are happening yeah. And and this is also, by the way, one of my very favorite directing techniques, which is just uh, word images. And I mean, we could do it right here, Brandon. I mean, if you say, like, say to me, do you like cucumbers? Do you like cucumbers? Okay. Now let's imagine that a cucumber is a dildo that has just been used and hasn't been cleaned. <laughs> say that again, please. <laughs> you like cucumbers? <laughs> See, the thing is that that word had meaning now. Absolutely. <laughs> And <laughs> load it up with, uh, <laughs> and so, and if that, and that means that if you load it up with imagery and by the way, the great, the reason this is such a great directing technique is that there is none of the stuff of on this line, do this on that line, do that. It's just that I'm right. putting, and, and basically like 70% of your brain goes towards spatial reasoning and, 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 and visualizing. And that's also why if you want to remember where you put your keys, you should just visualize them in the kitchen on, under the foot of a dinosaur in your kitchen. And now I ask you in 20 years, where are the keys? You'll say under the foot of the dinosaur. And the, and the point is that if you direct the word images mm-hmm. and you basically just pepper the script with what the words mean and, and with, with imagery, then all you have to do is read the script and you can't not put that into it. There's no timing. There are no cues. It just pops into your brain, pops into your brain when you get there. Yep. Yeah, I mean, I think I think for me, I mean, one of the things that was the biggest distraction in, in this one, and again, 
knowing that, I mean, I've made this mistake and I think every, every actor has made this mistake, whether it's uh, smoking a cigarette or eating something, right? That you've got to realize that there, no matter what you're physically doing, that, that nothing is more important than your other players. You know, we, there was an article a bit about, um, because this comes to the Lieutenant with the pizza or the donut or whatever he was eating Yeah, because he's, he's not, he's not listening to the, and this is the listening. He's not listening to the other guy rather that he's just, just going about his business. The best eating listening that I've seen, there's two of them. And I, I, I use them as like a learning tool for myself. Brad Pitt in the oceans movies. Mm-hmm. Now, Brad mm-hmm. Pitt, he did an interview a bit ago. He's a grazer. Cause he didn't know what to do when he was a young actor and he physically didn't know what to do. But so one of his directors or teachers or something said, well, what do you like? He goes, well, I love to eat. Like, okay, so why don't we, <laughs> true. You know, he's like a Midwestern guy. He loves to eat. And it says, well, why don't we integrate that? So if you watch in a lot of his stuff, but specifically the oceans movies, he's always snacking on something, but <laughs> it's, it's like the George Burns, like talk, talk, talk. Then you go. You know, he uses it as a, as a form. It's like, it's almost like as a, a form of listening, uh, like a tool off himself. Um, uh-huh. Marlon Brando and on the waterfront, he chews gum. So difficult to do, but he chews gum when he's walking with, I forgot the girl's name, but he's walking with the girl and she's telling him about her brother. And he, you know, he, he he's listening and he's denying everything. And he asks her, he's taking off the glove and he asks her if you want a piece of the gum. And he uses this gum. And he puts the gum in his mouth and he's chewing the gum, but he's listening. And it's not like a horse's mouth. It's just listening. The cop in this one is, it's almost as if. He's just shoving food in his face. And I mean, if I was the actor, I'd slap the damn pizza out of his mouth. You're going to probably lose your, lose your job, you know, small, small cop, um, you know, against your boss. But at the same point, it's like, look at me. I'm more important than that pizza. You know, and so force, force, there is that whole thing. That's like, I'm going to force you to get what I'm saying, to yeah. listen to what I am, to, you know, I'm here, um, which is they, the younger actor, the, the, the younger cop needed more of a need. Um, and the older cop just needed to stop. But that's so weird with the older cop, because does he want to talk to him or does he not want to talk to him? He looks like, it looks like he wants both things equally much at the same time yeah. and they're opposite. And that bothers me. Um, I still can't answer why, why is he talking to him? But I guess, I mean, okay, maybe the young cop is just kind of imposing. I mean, I'm busy, says the older cop, and then the young cop is just imposing himself on it. But the thing is that he's not busy. He's obviously not busy. And so I thought if you were going to do the busy angle, then I would like literally block that into it. I took some notes here. Yeah. Um, Because eating is not enough of a distraction. Like you could mm-hmm. face somebody and eat and still listen. So eating is, it's not the eating that's preventing him from, from listening. It's yeah. not needing to be somewhere because he stops and turns around. He has time for that. So I thought if he's going to be busy and distracted, then for example, I would like him to be on an important call on the phone while he's having this conversation. That, that, so this is, I'm spitballing here. This would work. With the mustachioed because, mayor. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, okay. I I think maybe there's, we're possibly walking into some plot logic here. Um, <laughs> um, but I mean, so how would that work? So he's, uh, so he has to, uh, just a second, this guy wants to say something to me and then he comes, yeah, hey, okay, just a second. And now he's legitimately distracted. Yeah. Could, could he be pulling him out of a huddle with other higher ups so that he's taking time away from so that all of the superiors talking to one another about that's, something? Very I mean, important. you could do that, but it would almost be its own scene that goes before it because that's like a tap, tap, excuse me. And, mm-hmm. and that kind right. of stuff. And again, yeah. even, even, you know, Brendan, you were talking about, you know, utilizing, because there's not a lot of utilization of the environment. Mm-hmm. you know, is what I'm seeing as well. And the environment also being the other two players that, that, you know, the, um, you know, the, the, yeah. the, the extras or whatever you want to, you know, background. Um, but where it's, you know, if I'm telling you something secret, there's, then, then we have to, then we have to do this quickly and you can tell me right away and then we can move on. But there's no urgency to that. And just like you said, pair, I mean, if he, if he's juggling this guy, then I'm telling you a secret. Then we've got these other two players here. And then something new pops up. It's like he's being pulled in 30 different directions, which then, I mean, 
I don't know, physically. Then he's himself. not generating the distraction himself. And that's what bothers me is that he's, mm -hmm. he's generating the entire distraction by having to eat that pizza at the same time. <laughs> And it's like tickling yourself. It doesn't work. I mean, it's like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's like it, ha it has to come from the outside. It's the same thing that if somebody wants to beat somebody up in a movie, but he doesn't. Yeah, that's that creates this weird force field. It's like you want to beat him up, so why don't you? But the moment, oh, sorry, the moment you have some people pulling him back, then he can just put all his might into wanting to beat him up, and then you have some an external force pulling you back. But and it's the same thing. Like if. If you have to surprise yourself, like you're in a horror movie and you have to <gasps> suddenly, you can't really do that. You can see the signal in your brain before you can see, I'm going to be surprised. I'm going to be surprised. Here it comes. <gasps> right. <laughs> <laughs> and Tavish, yeah, to this way, what we're talking about would make Tavish have to compete for his attention and lose slowly over the course of the entire scene. If he is focused mm -hmm. entirely on what he is doing, the very busy work of being in yeah. charge of a police precinct, and uh, Tavish has to keep wanting to get his attention and, and the stakes for getting his attention get that much deeper, then the scene really starts to claw forward. I mean, but all of this is still assuming that, that we're going with the busy angle. So I agree with everything that we've said so far, but I would still worry that this would still be lost in racing through the scene. And mm -hmm. so the question is, what conversation should we be having with the actors about slowing? I wouldn't say slowing the scene down because that's, that's just like pour, pouring a molasses over it. Right, mm -hmm. right. And I don't think, I don't think the term necessarily you know, slow down. But how do we make the words matter? I think make your point. Make your point. And so do you mean, I mean, what would you tell the actor? Would you say, I mean, you know, make sure he's listening to you? Well, I, I would say that if you're not, if you're not getting, I mean, I mean, we can go back to like the Stanislavski, the tactics, right? I mean, something just simple as that is, is that if you're, if you're not getting what you want, then you have to change. And there's not mm -hmm. a lot of change. There's not a lot of adjusting your tactic, you know, um, because I think the, and, and this is this is just my impression that the actors are. You so know, there's a great uh, missed opportunity for that. Like if you were playing Tavish here, because he does the same thing. But Captain, you, with all due respect, sir, but how am I supposed to? So right. if you see this just as classic Stanislavski, that I have an objective, I have an obstacle, and now I have to adapt in order to basically penetrate that obstacle. I mean, so it's and, like, you know, and so here, ask, yeah, I mean, so we have three lines here where no four lines because it says no three. Okay. Three lines where he's legitimately trying to overcome that obstacle, but with the same tactic. Like if we wanted to just mark up the script, should we just come up with a tactic for each of them? So the first one is that's not funny. All right. Well, I'm not transferring you. Okay. But captain, you, mm -hmm. How do we want to play that line if we're just going to put like an active verb on it or something? So, uh, something like he's he's betraying something he said before. But Captain, you said that if this remained a problem, we could talk about this or something like that. Some and mm -hmm. and so that gives him a sure, solid footing at first that he has but a captain. That, I mean, but what's he so. playing there? I mean, he could check him. No, but Captain, you said, you know. So you promised. I mean, that's the line. As you, I mean, that's the subtext. Is but you promised. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Right. I'm just writing that down. Okay. So, so calling him out. Yeah. 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 Is the tactic. Good. That's so, great. Absolutely. Calling out. Okay. That's the tactic the first time. So then the next one, I'm just going to read the last part of the captain's lines. It says, hey, if nothing else, it gives you a chance to give Reynolds a message. All right. Well, I probably need. Okay. So I'm going to read the whole captain's line because I don't think it makes sense by itself. So I need you both on the case. There's just no discussion, right? The mayor's so far up my butt with the whole missing college girl thing. I can feel his mustache tackle, tickle my kidneys, which is a line, by the way, I would love if that could stick. But yeah. okay. Yeah. I need, right. I need everybody out there. I can get to track this girl down. Hey, if nothing else, it gives you a chance to give Reynolds a message. All right. And then he says, with all due respect, sir. Mm -hmm. What's the new it, tactic here? Yeah, I mean, go y'all go ahead, Brian. Well, it it feels like filler as is. It's a tough one because to to apply a tactic to, but it's got to be something like it's not going to work. I've seen too much of Reynolds' inner life uh, as a cop. He's 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 beyond well, the pale at this point. So okay, think, so that's 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 one option. Is basically it's hopeless, right? And I mean, it's almost like you know, you're 
you know, he set himself up. I mean, if we're if we're looking for the tactical change, he set himself up is that the first one, you know, he checked his boss. Mm. Okay. So he he corrected his boss. He put his boss in the place. This time, you know, this is your pullback, right? Because okay, and then you know, I was going in the opposite direction. That this would be the with a, with all due respect, sir. This this could be even more. But you promised this could be. I'm sure. I'm going to throw the book at you now. But sure. but with all due respect, sir. I mean, this is not by the book. This is um. This sure, is I'll this is not you. cool. So he's threatening him. Oh, yeah, I'll, I'll go, go to internal affairs over this, there. and I'm going to report you to the mayor. Your job will yeah. be done. My job might be, you know, as well. But at the same time, then we're both fucking out. Excuse right. me. Right. Yeah. No, no it's okay. I, I, we became our rated some while back, so it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> He's going to go the full it's separate. Feel excited, yeah. So, because when you say with all due respect, sir, that is actually that you're holding back something worse, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, that's so. You know, it's that's basically so dialing it up. Is that if you don't make good on what you promised? Or the threat. Yeah. Okay. So then, then it keeps going. The captain says, look, if you, if you both can bring in this missing girl without any of his hijinks or anything like that, maybe I'll see the light. I don't know. Maybe there you I go. Because he just, there you go. The captain's knees in that line, the captain's knee buckle. Okay. So that means that, so what's the captain actually doing here? Because now we're doing like classical beats here, which is good by the way. I mean, it's good for understanding it. So what's the captain doing here? negotiating well i mean maybe i mean maybe you'll see the line i mean he's he's conceding right uh -huh. yeah yeah forfeiting um although i i heard it as maybe he'll see the light in the delivery of the line uh because um when when i was listening oh, to okay. the scene i mean it's I so it, there's so much pizza in there it's really hard <laughs> <laughs> i know it's so no true well maybe a little bit um, I, I heard it as maybe I'll see the light, which I thought was a better, I thought that was a cleverer line, but what does the line even mean? If it says maybe he'll, maybe he'll see the light. Yeah. So maybe Reynolds, the way I heard it, it would be maybe Reynolds will change his ways and come over to the light side of the force. If you show him that you but can do this by he's the book. asking to be transferred. Right. And so I thought that maybe if you can get all this working, maybe I'll see the light and maybe I'll transfer you like you want. That's how I understood right. it. I mean, I have it oh, right yeah. here. Should we should we try to just answer it quickly? Oh, yeah. That, yeah. Um, Let's see. Because it is a very different scene either way. It sort of. Split yeah, I think I think it's kind of important. Yeah. Look, if you both can bring in this missing girl without any of his hijinks or anything like that, maybe he'll see the light. I don't know. Maybe you can see you can get the result without the misconduct. Look, yes. if you both can bring in this missing girl without any of his hijinks or anything like that, maybe he'll see the light. Definitely no. aisle. Maybe he'll see you can get the result without the misconduct. Yeah. So, so that is interesting that he cracks the door. That 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 gives a lot more topography. To well, I mean, emotion. so the way the way he's presenting the scene is still like I don't give a shit. Um, but you could rewire the scene so that Tavish is basically threatening him here, and then the captain actually dials it a little bit back. And I mean, oh, even, there's then there's a beat there, right? Because then Tavish keeps going, and then the captain takes the whole concession back and says, "Okay, well then, screw you." Right? Yeah. It, yeah. I mean, yeah. th do you hear this? Do you hear the beat? Maybe he'll see the light. I don't know. Maybe he'll see you can get the result without the misconduct. How much? Or you know what? You can turn your back on him like you tried to do today. There it is. Because right it, yeah. because it's right there. Yeah. 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 Like you did, to, like you tried to do today. So it turns out this. Uh, I think you are two faced. Yeah, and you have betrayed your partner, and you will be you have forever have the stink of a traitor around this precinct. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and so, he, and he needs to take that in. Like that. There's yes, you know, yes, yeah. You know, so I mean, what I hear under the captain's line is that I am perfectly capable of giving you lots of punishment. So just back off, buddy. You're new here. Right. <clears throat> right. right. Or, or, you, or, you, or you'll just be heading out. You're going to have the scarlet letter. You're going to be the piece of shit. And then, then nobody's going to want to work with you. But hey, yeah. you know, if you want that, then that's yeah. great. But again, like to push that urgency on that, you know, be like, you know what, buddy? It's like, you're new. I've been here for 35 years. I've got my Medal of Honor. Nobody knows who you are. You've got a chance because you're not bad. But. Yeah, you you're, but you're on thin ice. So, I mean, just, uh, okay, I let you have that one, but but that's and, it. 
Yeah. And it could be even a bit of a rope a dope. This is probably not. This is bad for acting, but it's probably not the first time he, uh, this this guy, the captain, has had this conversation with young cops and he's gotten better and better at it and mm -hmm. he sort of lures him in and if his knee buckles on maybe i'll see the light or it, it may be a trap where he's sort of letting him get more and more bold before he drops this the 16 ton weight on him of uh the scarlet letter if you want it you know that's that's a great point that, and that could be something that it's like absolutely absolutely and that could be you know I mean, if, 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 the, if the captain's going to have an agenda, then it's essentially, I've got my back pocket. I've got my back pocket. Are you done? Are you done? Good. Okay. Here's the deal. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's, it's like, <laughs> good, good. That's nice. You know, it's like the Beverly Hills cop, like the Axel Foley when he's talking to, you know, to his, his, you know, his lieutenant, you know, Axel goes, no, 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 no. And he goes, here's the deal. You know, are you guys done? Get it all out of you. Now I'm going to tell you what the facts are. Yeah. That's good. That's a yeah, that's a cool little transition you got there. That's good. Yeah. Um, how do you feel in working with uh, like like doing like basically marking all the beats like this? Well, I mean, I mean, I, I have a little bit of an opinion myself because I think that if the goal in the beginning is, is just to figure out what it's what's going on in the scene, then I think it's super helpful. But I think that the same like once. Once you've agreed to those beats and they feel right to you, then I think you really shouldn't be taking them with you on the set. Like, I agree. Like, I agree. Yeah. It's a great detective tool, but yeah. and I, it might be different when you're doing theater because you're trying to get the beats to work over like such a long stretch that if you don't basically have a way to color all the lines, like this line here is more yellow. This, I mean, figuratively, this one here is more more blue. Then, then you can't stay on your arc, I guess. Right. I yeah, in the I theater, you need you need to build a trellis for the roses, you know. But, like but it, it seems like here we need to get to a place where the scene makes sense emotionally, and then we just need to let all that research go, and then just play it and see what happens. Right, Amen. right. I mean, I think you know that that this that this well, this I think the entire project it's a dramedy, right? So with with a dramedy, it's like you've got to. You've got to find the joke because because the writing the potential of the writing is there that the archetypes of the characters are there they look great um, but you know you've got it you've got to find the jokes so mark your jokes mm -hmm. where the writer is meaning meaning to hit these but up right and then <laughs> yeah. like you know and this this is all this is all obviously you know preset this is all stuff that that we're working you know when when we've gotten the original script and so it's like. You look at my scripts. My scripts look like I've got a I've got a five year old niece and a nine year old niece, eight years old. She's turning nine. We won't tell her. But I mean, my 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 scripts look like a coloring book, right? Is that I mark the heck out of them. I do a bunch of my writing and a bunch of my you know my prep before, and then I close. I literally I take my book. I close the book. I have my moment, like where you know, obviously your moment before where you're coming from. But then you go and you leave all of that homework. Yeah. It's gone. It's away. And then I just pay attention to you. And then if the work is right or visceral, right, then it'll come. And then the, your your moments of genuinity, your your moments that you know your your truly funny moments, or or your you know your 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 big you know emotional beats and things, those should come naturally. And then if they don't, then okay. Let's take a pause yeah. because that's a big thing. Nobody's there's no breath in this scene. There's no, you know, there's but no, how would you, how would you bring that back? Because obviously we don't, we don't just want to tell people to go slower. Like, no. because slower is not a thing. It's just, uh, you know, it's just pouring goo over it. So it's, so right. it drags it's, it's, more, right? It's not this, yeah, and it's not the speed, it's the need, and it's the ah. need to be heard and understood. So, don't very you feel that? I mean, do you feel that? You, I mean, if you were doing this scene and you were rushing it, is that, I mean, is that what would be the most useful thing for you to hear? Like, I mean, I guess what I would probably tell you is you that, know, is that I feel like the words, he's not receiving the words. I mean, you gotta, you gotta do something to make sure that he hears you. Like you gotta pause after the words or something, or you just like, just need to give it a second and just look him in the eyes and just make sure he's actually paying attention to you or whatever. I, like, what could I, I tell you? I think, I think for me, 
the the best thing that a director could ask me, especially if if you know something's not working, is okay. Are you getting what you want? Mm. Simple, but, right? but still, getting what you want still is predicated on understanding what the character wants. Like, well, that, that's like, a, that's that's a big thing. Too, like, what if you got kicked into the scene and you're just doing the words, but you have no idea what any of this means? And this is oh, not a question you've answered. Got a big problem. <laughs> yeah, I know. Well, what about, but <laughs> what about this? If you say, if if I came to, up to you on the set, Brandon, and I was like, okay, you've got you these. This is written very florally. You have a lot to say here, but I also want you to weaponize silence and pauses. So Ooh, use that's silence good. in order to, especially for the for the captain, he can he can pause whenever he wants, and it's a status play. Because yeah. he speaks, the world listens, and this cop just has to listen to what he has to say, and he can enjoy pausing. I love and, that. And, I and love that. I love that. That's fantastic. Yeah. And weaponizing yeah. silence. Yeah. And the because and the young guy has to wait. Mm -hmm. Then we yeah. could yeah. then we could do another thing in those gaps. The young guy could start to say something, and then the captain could start speaking again. Exactly. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. And, yeah. And the and the scene cuts together a lot better that way too. In yeah. the in post, you know, where there's so much there's so many more handles for the editor to play with to get the ex to sculpt the exact right scene. No scenes will be trashed by dovetailed lines. Half of great edit though. half of editing is deciding on the length of moments. And if you don't have any moments, it's really hard. Yeah. I mean, I guess you create those you create those moments if you have a shot on each, then there's going to be a time even if they're basically all their dialogue is back to back to back to back. You're still going to have a shot on somebody who's listening and you can cut to that and basically inject gaps into the scene by that. But that's half of what oh, right. you're doing in editing is just creating, yeah. creating the, how the listening works. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, if you, when you look at, and this is exactly what you just said, Brandon, and here's, here's a, here's an example of that. You know, when you look at, what is it now? 22 years or 20 some years of law and order SVU, right? To weaponize that silence. That's phenomenal. And by the way, I'm going to steal that because I love I, it. I, that is so stolen. That's a, that's just and, a I mean, dynamite that's, wording. That's so it's perfect. And it, it's extraordinary. But <laughs> when you, you know, when you see these players, right, we all know da 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 where you you get Olivia or you get Ice T or, or you know you know all of them when they stop and they're listening to it yeah. because it's like the power of silence. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is something my, a lot of people are afraid of silence, and it actually this happens in music as well. So I I used to be a music producer in the in the nineties, reasonably successful music producer, and really? but like pop music and pop music is also really afraid of silence. So mm -hmm. so this was the perfect thing for me, but I um, but I found always that that's always what makes the things work is that when you when you carve out the gaps around it. Yes. <clears throat> yeah. And yeah, like we were talking about earlier, the holding back or the uh, like the silent scream from Mother Courage. I mean, where Helena Weigel just screamed like that and the audience fills in anytime there's a gap or a negative yeah. space in something, the audience will do the rest and fill it all because in. Because it's almost building, like you're, you're, you're putting windows. you're putting too much pressure in the chamber and there's no room for the audience. Yes, correct. correct. Right. Because how exactly. often do we underestimate we, we underestimate the, you know, that how, how wise the audience is. We all do. We're like, well, we have to fill everything in. We have to, we have, no, we have to do it. Yeah. Trust that they will, because that's part of the magic. I mean, that's the, that's the, the collaborative process is that there's. I'd really like to learn this. <laughs> <laughs> we all would. <laughs> no, but to be comfortable with that, because I mean, and it's in my, it's in my writing too, that there are potential moments and I just, I, oh no, silence, shit. And then I move on to the next thing. And right. um, because, but I mean, it's not so much that I'm afraid of the sign. Like there's being afraid of awkward silence, but there's also just the fear of boring people. And I have a deathly mm -hmm. fear of boring people. Yeah. My uh, my wife is a cinematographer, mostly for documentaries. And she, we talk about how the camera is basically life's fast forward button. And the metabolism of life on set is much faster than real life. 
And so in editing, when you get the t- she, she finds with she's sometimes working with other cinematographers, they'll hold the shot for about seven seconds and then they get bored really quick and then get, change the angle when she but the editor is like, I needed that for 30 seconds yeah. because real life was about to happen. It's the you same know? thing as calling cut too soon. Yes, exactly. <laughs> yeah. And so, yeah. And so, I, yeah, you have to beg the actress. OK, even when you hear cut, keep going, keep acting. For a long time after cut and before yeah. action, <laughs> you know, yeah. because we can use all that. Yeah. And and there's a there's a sense there's a metabolism that mu- you have to be, know that life is at uh, it's like a, a, a YouTube video being played at one point four X, you know, <laughs> at when the camera's rolling and you have to uh, adjust for that. But see, let me point let me point out two things, because now we're kind of looping back to some of the insights that we had in the beginning, because this is like a one sixty eight hour film project and and everything is in the ru- in a rush. And when you're in that kind of a rush you don't really appreciate silence and letting it breathe. I mean, that's just not a value while you're shooting. It's, you're not even seeing it through the camera. You're just like, when that part is there, you're just drumming your fingers. Okay, say something, say something so we get more lines in in the can. Right. Um, but it's also that when you haven't filled the characters with subtext, then mm-hmm. then the silence behind the scene is just dead air. And once there is subtext, and half of that is subtext that the actors are actually aware of and it's kind of leaking out in the performances, but the other half is just the subtext that we know about as creators of the story, that we know that all these moments have meaning that might not actually literally be there in the scene, but we know it's there, so we make space for it. And and I think because what you have in a lot of scenes that aren't done I guess done well is that you have a strange dead air behind the scenes. So even when you're, even when you have the silence, it's bad silence. It's not good silence. And, Mm -hmm. and once you figure out the scene, then suddenly there is a, there is a psychology in those gaps and then you value the gaps. And now you want to put, let them be on screen just as much as the talking. Right. And that's those gaps are where it infuses the audience and becomes a full emotional experience. Like the the 20 minutes in the middle of Blood Simple where there is no dialogue yeah. uh, and you are riveted the entire time and don't need dialogue. And everyone's being quiet. And yeah. uh, the guy's trying to bury Dan Hedaya alive. <laughs> uh, and you're just you forget that human vocal cords exist because you're so drawn in. And then someone speaks again and it's startling. But you've been in it the entire time. That's pretty cool. That's pretty right. cool. Yeah, I mean, I mean, it's tr- like I said, it's trusting, it's trusting your viewer. You know, it's trusting because that's again, that's the art. That's like well, I guess it's know. also trusting the script then because sure. it's it's yeah. it's trusting yeah. that there is meaning in the script that I can't see from where I'm standing. Like I'm standing down in the scene. I don't know where I am in the story, but if you were to understand this in the context of the whole story, then this moment here would have much more meaning. And I feel like when you're working fast. This is the first circuit to blow. And then you, I think, you, I think trust is the big, that's, yeah. that's, I think the, that can be one of the major issues with the whole thing is that, you know, in, in, in the entirety from top to bottom is that because we're rushing, we're unsure. Yeah. So we're thinking more on our heels and that there's not like, you know, everyone, let's just try to get all of our stuff in there, but there's not that collaborative trust between yeah, so the moments don't work, and right. then there are no moments in there anymore, and that's which I and that's why this is the paradox of shooting fast is that it probably takes longer because when you shoot fast, nothing works. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you think- have to build a sanctuary around the act of actually filming. When the actors come on set, first team comes in, mm-hmm. everything has to be. It's it's become like a church, and everything has to be get very calm well you um, need a, a very professional production and that's like that's what you know for example walking on a network show for example everybody yeah. understands their job the network yep. shows are i mean are so efficient you'll just faint yeah and yeah. i and i was and, on the set of oh. go ahead oh i'm sorry sorry to interrupt you um i was on the set of weeds uh, years ago, and there was a guy, uh, an actor, a day player who was screwing up a line, and it was an important line, and they kept having to do takes over and over. It took, you know, let's say nine or ten takes for him to get the line out, and he was really frustrated with himself. And uh, I watched as the director went over to him, and he could see that he was the actor was being really hard on himself, and it was in, it was make it was affecting his performance. Mm-hmm. And the director said, 
takes don't take time. Lighting takes time. And we all know that. So yeah. don't worry. We're here. You, you have all the time in the world. Everyone here. No one here is impatient with you. Everyone knows that lighting is really what we're waiting. We're always waiting for. So you can yeah. take all the time you need to do this. Exactly. And you got it perfectly. That's, 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 a, that's good. Yeah. And send yeah. this the stakes just came down completely. Yeah. Um something something that we had done again, I, you know, I shot a, a project and we we shot this thing in six and a half days and it was a full feature and it was a horror. And it was it was crazy. It was madness. Um but one of the things that we had run into in, in one of the scenes, and it was one of like the high octane dramatic scenes, was you know, there, everyone was rushing, similar just like to this. And it was just, -ta 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 -ta. and so our director, who's a, a great friend of mine, the mentor of mine, Julian, um, had said, okay, we're going to stop. So everyone stop. And we're just going to huddle up for a second. And we're just going to say the words. So let's just say the words. Um, so we did a quick word. Through. He goes, good. Now do it faster. We did it faster. He goes, now do it faster. And so, -da 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 -da. he goes, now. Nah. And again, we had a little time. He goes, now, let's just say it again and just take your time and just make sure that the other person is just hearing your point and just get it across and have every, have that word land. And it was that dichotomy of, of the op, you know, of the opposite, because then we did that and it was like, and it, all of a sudden, just in standing there, things started to pop and happen and people all of a sudden moved differently and they received things. And there was like the, all of a sudden these little gasps and breaths and things that went through. And then we went back to set. Mm. He goes, all right, let's play the scene. And we played the scene and all of a sudden things worked. So Good. it was one of the, that's cool. You know, it was forcing, let's, let's force all the air out of it. Let's just, let's just deflate the, the shit out of the balloon. Nothing gets in, nothing gets out. Right. And then let's go even farther and even farther. Now, just land it. And we did. And then, then it was awesome because then cut. He goes, all right, checking the chip, moving on. And we were like, that was great. <laughs> yeah. and, it was, it was, and it was so fun. And it and wasn't even it wasn't even hard when you got to it. No. So, no. But I mean, don't, I mean, this is, this is kind of, this was kind of my beef that this was part of what made me get get clear on my camera blocking, um, which was where the whole original master course came from is that I was, I just really, I came from music video directing and I wanted, I realized that I'm probably a feature director because there are no narratives in music videos and I'm trying to kind of shoehorn narratives in there and they don't, and music videos don't really want that. So I guess I'm a feature director and I started learning all these camera techniques and, um, and shooting a bunch of shorts. Um, until I realized that I'm, I'm primarily trying to get my camera work straight. So let's, let me not bother people and actors and all this kind of stuff. If all <laughs> I'm doing is practicing my camera work, because one thing, one thing that I realized is that production is, is almost a hundred percent distracting. And the only way you can do good camera work and, and also think acting is if you're very, very good at the camera work, because the acting is the one thing that has to be live. Like everything else you can, you can plan. And one of the things, one of the things that's kind of the moral to the story, to the whole master course, um, is to reduce your shot count. Because I feel that there are a lot of directors who plan their shoots in a way where they, there's just no room for working with the acting. And especially like, for example, if you plan using storyboards instead of blocking in camera diagrams, then you have an automatic double shot count. And you now have a very stressful day. And I know that because I've done that. Like I've, I've done things where I've shown up with storyboards with time codes on them. <laughs> and, and, and just like, okay, so I guess we're just going to have to shoot 50 setups per day because that's the only way mm -hmm. to get through this. And, and many of those setups are different camera positions, different lenses, probably a little bit different lighting. And now you're just, you, you're, I mean, this train is going so fast and you're just barely hanging on. And if you can reduce your shot count by being more efficient with your blocking and getting more out of each setup, like for example, if you can get a scene down to eight setups instead of 15, now you have more than twice the amount of time to work on the acting. And 
be, you know, be creative and, hmm, okay, yeah, I mean, that that felt interesting, but, uh, I mean, I kind of want to, let's try to pull it in the other direction. Let's try this completely other idea we had. And you can afford to do that. And I think it's the dumbest thing that directors do is concentrate so much on cool shots and then also use the wrong techniques to get those shots that makes every shot its own camera setup. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. The enemy is the phrase, wouldn't it be cool if? Well, I mean, that's okay if you can integrate this. Like, for example, if you have an idea for a shot that's going to be, we're going to be on him, and then you have a separate idea that at the end of the scene, I want to push in on him a little bit. If you can realize that those are the same shot, mm -hmm. now now you have fewer shots. Mm -hmm. And so the, the point is, the, the point is just that you should set lower goals for a scene, like a two-page scene, max 10 camera setups. And some of those have to be like just inserts and pickups and stuff like that. And oh, then yeah. make There's... it work with that. And I was very impressed with a show with shows like Star Trek, for example, because they had their they had their blocking machine just working so well that mm -hmm. if you sat down to write down the shots, they only had like three or four setups in a in a scene and it just felt like double those setups. And oh, yeah. the point is that you, when you do that, when you're more efficient with the, there, I mean, there are basically what, where does all the time set go on the set? It goes every time set. you want to reset the camera to somewhere else, half an hour, right? Yeah. Okay, now we're going to have to redo the lighting. Okay, so suddenly the actors walk off set, and now we're ready to go. <laughs> where are the actors? Oh, I don't know. I think, uh, <laughs> and and it's basically every time you change camera setups, like the whole production just breaks up. And I, and it's uh, that and then retakes. And so let me, sorry, just if you can hold oh, your sure. thought. And the other half of that is to not make your shots needlessly difficult to do. For example, a very shallow depth of field and a focus rack that you just have to nail. And if you don't nail it, it's useless and you have to do it again. Because that's, that's what a director does when they're thinking mostly visually. And the tax on acting is just obscene. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Right. And the and and like in a musical, they often say that you don't want the audience doesn't walk out humming the scenery. And it's the same thing. <laughs> oh, that is so you you you're really a, you're on a tear. You're it's good. <laughs> oh, there's a well, it's like the exact same thing. Made for you, Brandon. What's that? We'll get some T-shirts made for you. <laughs> yeah. Good. Right. Humming the scenery. It's very <laughs> memeable. Go ahead. Right. Yeah, you like, and it's the same thing about this. The 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 scenery in this case would be the cool shots, you know, where suddenly you you got a steady cam, you paid a guy who bought the hundred thousand dollar rig for the one thing that swoops around. It, that can be really great and very useful and effective for stories. And I am guilty of using them myself. And I'm speaking autobiographically here. But ultimately, what the audience is going to remember is the humans mm -hmm. that they just watched be depicted, and how they were depicted uh, is secondary to what they were doing when they were being depicted yeah. well there was a um i don't know if you guys watched sling blade uh recently but i took you know dusted it off a couple of years ago and i was shocked to discover that um it is mostly masters on sticks I would say I, I wouldn't be surprised if there were like 14 shots in the entire movie. Sometimes he punches in here and there, but there are entire scenes that unfold on sticks, nothing else, just a doorway. And then there's a dramatic scene takes place with entrances and exits. And it's really powerful and, and hypnotic. And if you can have that constraint you're talking about, Pear, yeah. then you uh, then there there's something something comes over the audience and it, and it can actually become. You know what you should you, you have to watch? Tales from the Loop on Amazon. Oh, hmm. excellent. And okay. so, I mean, science fiction wise, I would want a little more science fiction. It's based on these drawings by this Swedish artist who created like this fascinating kind of 1970s world, but with this uh, kind of strange technology, just everyday things like just a... Uh, like just strange technology that's everywhere and it's completely normal. He had like these drawings of like this big robot in the background, just some guy, some kids peeing in the in the field and stuff like that <laughs> and but they created i mean so it's probably not a it's not a perfect show but there's one thing that they've done that is fascinating and that is that they have created silence and breathing in there like you won't believe and because i mean it's not ever it's not always that it works when people say let it breathe but here they really let it breathe and you get you get under the skin it's like you it's 
it's like you you become extra sensory. It's you mm-hmm. you pay more you pay more attention. It's like you can hear a pin drop, and yeah. it's it's really fascinating how they make that work. Yeah. You're yanked into the negative space. You, you I like get, you get completely sucked into the kind of yeah the the negative space, and it's yeah. almost like you're. It's like afterwards, like I'm picking up this pen and I'm putting it over here, <laughs> <laughs> because you become just a kind of hyper hyper aware. Yeah. yeah. And if you are racing through a script, you just get whatever's the opposite of hyper aware. <laughs> well, and you know what? It becomes white noise. It becomes numb. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's the whole. It's the whole adage that if, if everything's important, nothing's important. Yeah. Right. So I feel like we did some uh, pretty good work. On the on the scene here. I mean, obviously, we'll never know if we're right because we'll never go out and shoot it again. But so I like to do this exercise because it is hard when you have it. You're you're standing there on the set. You're doing a scene, and it's just the scene is full of dead air. And mm-hmm. now, as a director, you need to produce a solution quickly. And you can't just you can't just try all kinds of things because. Uh, that's gonna that's gonna send the actors. I mean, that's just gonna crush the actor's self confidence if we keep trying things that also don't work, <laughs> right? Yeah. And yeah. and so we need to be on a on a path to success quickly. And I have I have seen people, I've seen directors who have this sixth sense where they can immediately spot what's wrong with the scene and just come up with one or two really nuggets of direction, and then you can immediately feel. The scene just came alive. Now something's happening inside of the scene. And that's a skill that I would really like to have. And I get, and we do this exercise here to get a little bit better of it because there's a lot of things to learn about filmmaking that are better to not learn on the set where it's very expensive and you're wasting everybody's time. And so that's why we're trying to create these little, these little sidebars here where we can train a particular aspect. And, um, but I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm happy. The scene now has, has beats. Each of the characters has brain activity now. They didn't before. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and again, very true. Know, it, it, it is one of the, it is one of those things where, you know, in retrospect, you know, we, we can watch it and then we can see it and we're like, man, I don't know what was working. I don't know what, what they were thinking on this part. But again, in the moment, you know, I still, I still have to give the credit where credits due. Is like, two actors came in, they were playing. They, there were choices. They just could have been more, you know. And I think it's hard. It's hard, yeah. and that's also why it took us an hour to sit here and try to duke it out. This is hard, and I think the most daunting thing for a director or for an actor is standing with a scene. We're spending a thousand dollars a minute, and it's not working. And I don't even know why it's not working. And yeah. I think, yeah, that mean, I'm a big one. Preparation, preparation, preparation. Know the ins, the outs, and everything yeah. that could happen. And then, but then just leave it aside and then just play. Because I don't think, I don't, I, I don't think they were having fun. There's that. They were trying too. to get. They were trying to get through it. That's what it looks. They're trying like. to get it done. Yeah. You know. And, mm-hmm. and so, I mean, I, I want to reiterate that that I'm not. I'm I'm really not blaming them. When I'm blaming them, I'm really just blaming. It's a proxy for blaming myself, because <laughs> oh <laughs> no, oh. because this is this is just difficult. This is where the muscle is weak. This is where yeah. we need to become better at it, and that's why we do this. So yeah. that is very cool. Um, awesome. So I want to thank both of you, Brandon and Brandon. <laughs> Pear, thank you very much. I feel like you as single-handedly have advanced the cause of good direction in uh, the world over. Uh, oh my God, I'm going to, I'm going to blush so. now. <laughs> <laughs> I really, I really cool. appreciate that. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you, you know, guys. I mean, yeah. Us having the avenue to, you know, we've, we've got to be able to speak freely and be honest. Um, cause the yeah. honesty is, I think too. Yeah. Thanks. Thank awesome. you. Thank you, guys. So I really hope you thought that was interesting. This is an exercise you should be doing a lot yourself. And actually, get in touch if you'd like to join in an exercise on the show. And the same goes if you're getting ready to direct something, because this is exactly all the same prep work. So anyway, for now, remember to subscribe to get notified of new episodes. And I'll see you soon. 